Welcome back. We are waiting for the first criminal trial of a former president to get underway. Jurors are waiting behind the scenes. They have not yet started to go through the jury selection process. I want to bring you inside the courtroom for just a moment because uh, Donald Trump is being read of what is called his Parker warning. This is the judge telling him that he has to appear for court. Judge Murchon saying you have the right to be present during the trial and to assist your attorneys. Do you understand? Donald Trump says yes. Murchon says if you disrupt the proceedings, we we can proceed with the trial in your absence. Do you understand? Donald Trump says, I do. If you do not show up, there will be an arrest, Mershon says, underscoring that Donald Trump doesn't have a choice here. He's got to show up unless the court actually bars him from showing up. And while this process, this jury selection process, which we're waiting for, is going, it can, spe excuse me, it can stretch for a number of weeks. The former president is also at the same time fundraising off the criminal charges he's facing, and he claims he's being politically persecuted as he tries to win back the presidency. More than two-thirds of registered voters said the hush money charges facing Donald Trump are, quote, somewhat serious, according to a recent Reuters Ipsos poll. Around a third say the charges lacked seriousness. Joining me now is former chief of staff to Vice President Mike Pence, Mark Short, really good to have you. So Donald Trump wants to use these trials as campaign events because he's got to be there anyway. You can see him talking to the assembled reporters, the assembled cameras when he goes in and out of court. How does the campaign use this to their advantage? And do they really see it as an advantage to have the leader of their party on criminal trial? Well, Katie, thanks for having me. I, I think there's no doubt that it did play to his advantage through the primary season. I think that for a lot of Republican voters, they did view many of these pro uh, prosecutions as politically charged and felt like the president that they had identified with for four years, they were fond of the policies, was under political attack. I'm not so sure that that plays out the same way now that he is the presumptive nominee and you move forward into the general election campaign because the nation is very polarized and there's not many undecided voters left. And I think it, it probably in some ways it, it's more diminishing for the president to be seen in a courtroom than to be rallying outside one. And it, again, no doubt, I think it benefited him in the primary. I don't know that it's going to benefit him as much politically moving forward. Well, let, explain that, because obviously base voters are base voters. When you go into the general mm -hmm. election, do they expect that there are a lot of independent voters, a, a lot of swing voters or on the fence voters who are paying attention to this trial? Or do they believe that they'll be paying attention to the verdict of this trial? Well, I think you have to play the card that's dealt, and I think that the president has an enormous ability to get uh, media attention, and, and he, will, he will use this court as an ability to do that. But at the same time, I think for most voters in battleground states, I think they're going to be more concerned about what are your policy solutions to high grocery prices or to high energy prices, or what are you doing to fix the border, what are you doing, what would be your policy in the Middle East or in Eastern Europe. And so... I'm not so sure how much this really impacts those swing voters. I think for many voters, this is already baked in. And despite how sordid and fair it is, I think that there's probably greater legal liability for the president on the federal charges than I think a case that the previous district attorneys passed on twice. It's eight years old of a, of a campaign finance charge, and your star pro, uh, witness for the prosecution happens to be somebody who was convicted of lying to okay. Congress. And so I think at the end of the day, I don't think this really is going to benefit him much. To what extent it hurts him with where we are hard in our political system, I don't know, except that it, it limits his ability to talk about the things that are pocketbook issues for voters in battleground states. The thing, Mark, it's Chris Jansing here. The thing that yeah. this, the reality is, this may be the only of the four criminal trials that actually okay. makes it to trial before uh, the election. And so for folks who in 2020, who had voted for him in 2016, decided, no, I'm not going to do that. The exhaustion factor, factor. Mm. Uh, just the overall feeling that uh, Donald Trump was too immersed in too many things that made them uncomfortable. Does it make a difference whether or not he is convicted here in the sense of people may say, you know, I don't want to have a convicted felon as president of the United States. Is there a point at which for the very small number of critical voters who will decide this election, this will be a game changer one way or another, Mark? 
Chris, I think it's a great question. I remember in the fall of 2020 having an analysis from a group of swing voters in Wisconsin who had voted for Trump in 16, who were not reliable Republican voters. And they said, look, he took on the border like I wanted. He reduced taxes. I got a better trade deal. I'm a dairy farmer. Went down issues one by one. And the answer is, well, then you're voting for him again, right? It's like, no, I'm exhausted. I can't take the drama anymore. And so I do think that that is, that is a, a liability here. And I do think it could um, be a detriment to, to Donald Trump's campaign if, if they see him in the courtroom and this becomes, again, more and more the daily notion. But again, I think most voters in our country are already locked in. And there's a very small number that there's actually of swing voters left. And uh, Mark, Andrea here, one of the decisions this morning by the judge was that the Access Hollywood tape transcript could be admitted in evidence, but not the audio, not the video, so you won't see, the jurors would not see Donald Trump saying those things, it was so sordid at the time. Take us behind the scenes at that point in the campaign uh, when uh, the vice president, you were obviously, you know, on that campaign, when Vice President Pence, the running mate, with his you know, obviously uh, his evangelical background, his beautiful marriage and all of the rest. Well, how did he take that at the time? Well, Andrea, if you recall, um, there were those in the campaign who I think were anxious for um, Vice President Pence to be out front and sort of uh, providing a testimony to Donald Trump's character and saying um, that he was comfortable with this. But I, as I recall, um, the, the vice president's team was very clear in saying that, no, the president has to make amends for this and he has to go out and apologize first. Now, the video he did ended up obviously looking more like a hostage video. Um, but nonetheless, there was very much a sense that this is not something somebody else can attest to. Donald Trump has to make the apology first here. Mark, I'm so happy that Andrea brought up the excess Hollywood tape because part of what the prosecution is going to be arguing is that, I mean, the, the big thing here is that this is a felony. It's a campaign violation because Donald Trump had this woman paid off to keep her silent, Stormy Daniels, because of the moment that the campaign was in. The Access Hollywood tape came out on October 7th. The agreement to pay Stormy Daniels was on October 8th, according to Michael Cohen. Can you just explain how dire it felt within the campaign in that moment and how, how, how the campaign was worried about suburban women voters? Well, I think that you go back even in the summer, people forget that uh, it, despite a very contentious battle with Ted Cruz at the summer convention, Ted Cruz gave a speech in which he refused to support uh, Donald Trump. And so our party was already divided at that point. And I think that there was a sense that Hillary Clinton's campaign was well funded and, and, and more controversy wasn't helpful. But I, I still think that many of us underestimated the appeal that, that Donald Trump had for many middle class and Midwestern uh, voters in the Rust Belt. When you look at what happened in, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and there were other issues that clearly voters cared about uh, more at the time when he got to Election Day. Yeah, that's true. But in the moment, the campaign didn't know what was going to win out. Yeah, and they were very absolutely. worried about, about hemorrhaging voters that they needed. They were also very worried about hemorrhaging Republicans because, as you remember, Republicans in mass were backing away from Donald Trump. They were posting selfie videos saying they couldn't support him. Paul Ryan was telling, you know, right. members of the caucus to, to, to do their conscience, to follow their conscience. Don't worry about going out to support Donald Trump. Campaign... I, I advisors were <laughs> fleeing in droves. I mean, you, you I, yeah. won in the, in the end, but you weren't so sure you were going to get there after this tape. Absolutely, Kay. I mean, no, no one's going to argue that the tape was helpful. I, I think the, the, you're right. It, there was a lot of uh, division in the party, but, um, but nonetheless, I think there were other issues that overrode that. And again, will that be the issue as the way people view this trial? I, I don't know yet, but I, my sense is that probably so, that, that much of this is already baked into the electorate. Yeah, I get it. I just think in the in the terms of the trial itself, what the prosecution is arguing is that this was election interference. And so, yeah, yeah, the voters decided it didn't matter. But the prosecution is going to argue that this was this was the reason that that payment was made. It's going to be litigated all the way all over again in this trial. Chris. It will be. Mark Short, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the app store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.